Hey, good news, starting a new series about architecture. This time we're gonna be talking with Eric and Uli about resiliency in the cloud. Welcome to the Azure Enablement Show, where we'll be discussing the challenges you and our other tech savvy customers have encountered. Together, we'll be talking with experts to find out how they think about these problems, recommended tools and best practices, and tips they've learned from years of experience that you can use. So today on the Azure Enablement Show, we do something we've never done before. We're going to take our script, and we're going to simply rip it up, because we want to talk today about architecture. And architecture is a discussion. So, what I would like to do is introduce two of the smartest architects I know, Uli and Eric, um, who are, are going to join me for a discussion. And this discussion we hope to talk about is a little bit about cloud applications and failure. So welcome, Uli. Welcome, Eric. Hi, David. So uh, let's start off right at the place that, that I think uh, would be a good place to start since we're talking about failure. Um, I want to kind of understand um, these terms. I want to understand what terms we're going to be using because I've heard terms like uh, resilience and self-healing. Um, so uh, what's the difference between resilience and self-healing? What do you mean by when you say resilience? Well, for me, I think resilience is how your application responds to failure. So, so the way I think about it is that failure is something that happens, uh, whether it's a disruption to a cloud service or something that you expect to be there is no longer there. Uh, and as a result, it compromises the functionality of your application or your system. And resiliency is the degree to which your app can keep going gracefully uh, and disrupt as few users as possible. And so the way I think about it is it's a way to react to problems in one or more components of an application as those, those components go down or become unavailable or something unexpected happens. Um, but uh, it sounds like you're talking about fault tolerance. Not not resiliency, isn't it? Well, is that is that fault tolerance or is that resiliency? Well, resiliency is the outcome that you're looking for. Fault tolerance is a series of measures and tools that you can use to effectively achieve resiliency. So when you're thinking about high availability scenarios where you use, let's say, Azure availability zones as one of those tools that you can use, that is effectively a measure to increase the fault tolerance, which ultimately increases resilience. But fault tolerance is only one way of doing uh, things. And um, self-healing is a term you mentioned, David, in the beginning, uh, which is another one, which doesn't really have anything to do with fault tolerance because the tolerance to deal with failure um, is really the uh, literal translation. It really says, okay, now if a failure that uh, did occur, I didn't necessarily was able to work around it with um, availability zones or other uh, concepts. So now I need to figure out, can I recover from this failure? And that would be self-healing to a degree because um, this application or your workload knows how to recover from uh, specific scenarios. You can't do it for everything, but for certain things you might be able to say, actually, yes, this database connection failed or whatever it might be. Um, and my fault tolerant models didn't gripe, but now I would say, um, here is how I can recover from this error and move on. Um, Eric mentioned uh, degrees of availability or resiliency where the application might say, normally I'm able to handle 100,000 connections, users um, per minute or per second. Now I'm only capable of doing 10,000. I'm not completely down, but I can't do quite as what I'm designed originally to do because there are certain dependencies or other things that are just not available. So resiliency is all of this combined where you say, I'm using fault tolerant measures to increase the availability of my application. I introduce concepts like self-healing to effectively make sure that my system starts to recover based upon measures that I built into the solution once my fault tolerance measurements doesn't work. And then bringing it all together is really a resi resilient application. So you just said something that implies that availability is not necessarily a binary thing. It's not necessarily am I up or am I down? Am I down? And so can I assume that resilience is, is equally not binary? Either you're resilient or you're not? Yep. So there's some great examples um, out there. For example, if you're looking at a, um, a sports show um, where you effectively have a social media frame around the initial event, let's say an NFL um, game being projected. During the week when the game is only available on demand, the game is not that, it doesn't need to be that highly available because the social media chat 
is actually where people want to talk about the performance of the quarterback or whatever the, the measure might be. And so all of a sudden, the social media element of the application is more important than the actual video itself because the game has already been played. Now, go to Sunday, to game day. Now, all of a sudden, the video becomes super important because if the stream fails, people will be very upset. People might be unhappy if the social media uh, environment isn't available, but they won't crucify you. When they will crucify you, when they actually um, go and see uh, that this, the video stream is not available anymore. And so part of the art is to think through what is the components or what are the components of your solution, not in the technical sense, but more in the application scenario sense, like the video stream and the social media, and then determine the resilience measures and abilities you're building into the various parts of the application um, in general, and then also like in this um, example with on demand and live stream, you can you need to be able to switch and saying now I need to really focus on the stream because uh, this is a live game and it only happens once. Once it's not um, once it's done, it's done, and so you can't really repeat the game outside of an on demand video stream. So I want to get to some of the ways we do that. And I was just thinking that the other example that I like very much is the one of, of sort of a video streaming site like Netflix. Like if their recommendation engine goes down, the thing that tells you like what you might want to watch next goes down because it's just another microservice out there. Um, they, you don't go to Netflix and there isn't a big white box that says, sorry, no movies today. You know, like can't right. can't can't stream anything like that. So like, but how do we so how do we get here? Like are are there are there what do we got to do to get to this ability to go to, to a, for, I guess, to a degraded state is what kind of what you're talking about here. Um, I, what do we do from an architectural perspective, Eric? Like, what, 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 do, what do we do here? So I think, I think as architects, we tend to think about the technical components, how they interact and what the interaction model is and what the technology stack is and how resilient we can make it through things like fault tolerance and uh, patterns like caching and bulkhead and circuit breaker, like Uli was talking about. Those are all methods by which we implement resiliency capabilities into the DNA of an architecture. But the, the focus is, and I think as architects, we kind of have to shift our brains a little bit to say, well, what's the experience that we want to give? Uh, a, a partially functioning application has to have a low functionality mode, which, is, which has equal attention paid to the UX as if the UX was as equal as the, whether or not the UX is completely full fidelity. So as much as you spend a lot of time designing experiences when the application works uh, in a beautiful state and the way it's designed, you have to pay equal attention to what happens when a particular area of functionality or dependency is down. What is the user experience gonna be? And the questions that you need to ask is, can I fool people into thinking that the app is completely available? Uh, or if they go to do something, only then will I tell them, hey, check back in a few minutes. And in the background, my technical stack is implementing these retries, these timeouts, these um, all these architectural patterns to try and bring itself back online. So I think um, as architects, we have to shift ourselves a little bit to say, not only do I need to know the patterns for how to make sure a microservice, an interdependent microservice architecture is resilient and potentially approaches self-healing, but I have to create, and, um, and maybe not this isn't the role of the architect, but you have to inspire other people to help create a reduced functionality experience that you can build to. And well, David, going back to your Netflix example, very particularly. Yeah. So you use the recommendation system. I look at recommendations, the catalog and the actual video stream as three different workloads inside the Netflix application frame. And what Netflix is doing is they treat them as separate things. So your microservices, as Eric pointed them out. And if they can't get, for example, to the catalog, um, they always cache the last version of the catalog they have shown to you on the client. So obviously they want to get the last, uh, the latest offering to you, but if they can't, they show you an, an old version and most users don't really realize that. And they will keep trying in the background to get to the catalog, but at least the user has an experience. They can browse the, the catalog and stuff like that. They can't search, but there's something there. Another thing that I love about Netflix, they, they go not uh, low tech. So for example, a lot of people rely on traffic management capabilities or DNS and so forth to resolve from names to IP addresses. And that's the right thing to do. We want people to do that. But I also want them to say, who, if the traffic manager or the DNS server is not available, um, what do I do then? 
I only have a name, uh, Microsoft.com or Netflix.com or whatever it might be. Um, what Netflix at least used to do is they cache the IP addresses of the last call they made um, in a t little table on the client. And then they just try direct because sometimes it's the traffic manager or the DNS service that's not working, but the service is still perfectly fine. And as long as you have an IP address, you can get there. So those are some of the tricks uh, that Netflix, um, for example, uses. They uh, encoded this in a framework called Helix. And Helix is now part of the uh, Spring framework. Uh, so if you're a Java programmer, you will know the Spring framework, but Spring is also available for .NET coders and even Node.js coders. So all of these patterns that Netflix uses are available to those people that use the Spring framework, so Spring Boot um, and so forth. So I, I like that we're getting into sort of the nitty gritty and the architecture stuff. Um, there were a number of things that, that Eric said um, a moment ago, a number of different patterns that might support this stuff. And I think that we should get into that directly, but I want to do that probably like in its own video. And I think we're, we'll run out of time in this one. Um, would you join me in another video and we can talk a little bit about some of those architectural patterns and then like where we go from there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I blurted out a bunch. Um, so uh, we, we could probably go through each one of them and each one of them should be used in concert. So if we wanted to have to create a experience, the one like we were just talking about, you can't just choose one and say, oh, now I'm resilient. It's binary, as you mentioned earlier, David. You kind of have to use all these patterns in concert together. And as Uli mentioned, there are frameworks out there that actually have these implemented that you can just leverage, bring down as part of your code and build into your app. Okay, so hold that thought. We will be back on exactly that question. Let's talk about those patterns and then let's talk about where to go from there. Okay, well, we're deep in the middle of this conversation. I really hope you'll join us on the next episode where we pick up right where we left off. Join us again on the Azure Enablement Show.